Good morning, people of God. It is a joy to be here this morning. It's always a joy when I get to be with you all. Uh, Those of you who are here in person and who are joining us from home or wherever you may be. A few quick announcements before we begin our time of worship. First, today is first Sunday of the month, which makes it Communion Sunday. So if you are here in person and did not get your little Lunchables communion on your way in, make sure you uh, connect with one of the ushers. Kent or Jim can help you out with that. Um, If you are joining us from home, either uh, via Zoom or later on via YouTube, feel free to go ahead to your kitchen and grab whatever you have that could serve as communion elements, some bread, some juice, uh, things along those lines. Another note, today you'll notice some different sort of decor down in front of me near the communion table. Today is Native American Sunday. So in the United Methodist Church, six times a year, we take one Sunday, denomination-wide, to celebrate and to recognize a certain group of people. And so there's a student Sunday in November. There are other sorts of Sundays that we honor and recognize different groups of people within our communities. And this Sunday is Native American Sunday. So along with that comes an opportunity to give towards Native American ministries. Um, You'll see in your bulletin, if you are joining from uh, in person, there there is either a thing that looks like this, it's a little two-sided card with a code on the front, or there might be an envelope that looks like this. There were, I think, five bulletins that that wound up with the envelopes. They serve the same purpose. Uh, The envelope, is where you can put some cash or a check if you wish to make a donation to uh, Native American Ministries Sunday. This little card has a little square on it that looks kind of like it's got this black and white pattern. That's something that you can use with your phone or tablet to donate online. So if you show that to your phone or tablet, it'll take you to a website where you can donate online. If you're not sure how to do that, Ask me or your grandchildren or your neighbor's kids or whoever, um, and somebody will be able to help you out with that, I'm sure. So um, two different ways that you can give towards Native American Sundays. Uh, if If you have one of these code thingies and you're not comfortable giving that way, even with the help of your neighbor's kids, then what you can do is just write a check, um, submit it to the church, and make sure you put in the memo line Native American Ministries so we get it to the right place. Last announcement, and this is one that I'm really excited about. Today's the day. Today is our town hall meeting. So right after worship, starting at 11.45, the leadership team will be up here uh, leading our town hall meeting. This will be an opportunity for the congregation to get to know some of the members of the leadership team, to gather some information about some goals that we have for the church and how we're doing financially and things like that, and to have your questions answered. Several of you submitted some really good, thoughtful questions. And so we've got written responses all prepared for those that we will offer during our town hall meeting. We'll end pretty promptly at 12.30 so that you can get home and get your lunch and get out into the garden today like I plan on doing. Um, If you are joining us from home for the town hall meeting, you have two options. One, you can just stay right on Zoom like you are right now. So don't close the Zoom window after worship. Just keep it open as though worship were still going. The other option, if you want to take a quick little break, is that you can close out the Zoom window, leave the Zoom meeting, and then come back in at 11.45 using the same exact login information that you used to to join us this morning for worship. So it's the same exact way that you log in um, for worship. That's how you'll log in at 11.45 for the town hall meeting. And so, two different ways to join us from home. Uh, If you're joining us here in person, you can just uh, take a few minutes after worship to greet each other and to chit-chat and whatnot, and then just be back in here. We'll do the town hall meeting in here um, at 11.45. I think that's it for announcements at this point. I invite us now to take a breath, center our hearts, and prepare to hear what God has for us this day.
Amen. I love the text at the end of that intro. That's Christ have mercy. God have mercy. Christ have mercy. Let us pray together. God of our ancestors, recall to our minds and hearts your redemptive power. We know that you make all things new. Redeem us so that we, like the heroines of the ancient scriptures, might be chain breakers and change makers. May it be that we, disciples of the risen Christ, transform the world. Amen. Would you stand as you're able and join in singing, Christ is risen, shout Hosanna. hearts in a moment of confession and compassion. The ancient sacred story of redemption culminated in the death and resurrection of Jesus, but it didn't start there. Long before Mary birthed Jesus, God began the work of redeeming that which was broken. The story of Ruth exemplifies this with the intricate ways in which tragedy and desperation are transformed into connection and provision. What makes it hard for us to trust that God will redeem us too? Let us take a moment to reflect in silence. Hear this compassionate word from Jesus. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And for the times when we live like redemption is not a part of our story, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The peace of the risen Savior be with you.
Amen. All right, for our children's message this morning, we're going to unpack a word. What I mean by that is we're going we're gonna to talk about a word that's really just a churchy word that we don't really hear anywhere else, and we're going to have some conversation about what it means. So this might be a time for grown-ups to listen up to, because this is, this is a word that we struggle with sometimes. The word is redemption. Redemption. Our sermon that we're going to hear in a, more, in a few minutes this morning is called Ruth and Redemption. And, and redemption or redeem, that's one of those words that like, we hear a lot in church, and it's kind of unique to church. But what does it even mean? I like to think of redemption as like recycling. It's like God's recycling program for our life. So when we recycle something, like let's say uh, this morning after my shower, I finished the shampoo bottle, and so I put the empty shampoo bottle in the recycling thing because it's a type of plastic that we can recycle. So, so what happens then? Well, the empty shampoo bottle and all of the other recycling stuff goes to a recycling center, and it goes through a process that basically makes it usable again for something new. So that old plastic shampoo bottle can now be a new plastic shampoo bottle or really anything else made of a similar type of plastic. So so recycling is kind of the way that we take something that's old and not useful anymore and possibly a little messy, kind of like trash, and, and put it through a process that turns it into something new and beautiful and useful and good. So redemption is like God's way of recycling our lives or things that happen in our lives or things that happen in the world. See, one of the things that we see over and over and over and over again in the Bible is uh, s- stories where God takes something that's a really bad situation, a really sad or hard or painful situation, and then out of that bad situation brings something new and good. I, I think the, the favorite, my favorite version of that story is the death and resurrection of Jesus, right? Resurrection is the churchy word for when Jesus came back to life. And that's, that's the whole point of Easter, and really the whole point of what it means to be Christian is to embrace this story, to believe this story that God brought Jesus back to life even after fear and hate had killed him. That's, that's the ultimate redemption story right there because the other piece of that story is the truth that when that happened... God made it abundantly clear to the whole world that nothing can separate us from God's love, not even death. So how does redemption happen in, like, in our lives, in, in real life today? I want you to think for a minute of something sad or frustrating or scary or painful that happened recently. Anything in your own life, grown-ups can think of something too, anything at all. Maybe a kid picked on you at school, maybe uh, your pet or someone you loved died, maybe someone like yourself or someone you care about got sick or hurt, anything along those lines. Take a minute to think of something. Now I want you to see if you can think of anything good that's happened that wouldn't have happened except for that. I can give an example. So let's pretend that the thing you're thinking of is is being really sick earlier this week. Well, in in my Benjamin's case, he's my three-year-old. He was pretty sick all week, just with a a head cold. It's not anything like COVID or the flu. We tested him for all of that. It's just a head cold, but it turned into an ear infection the way it does when you're three. And so he's missed a lot of school this week, and that's been bad and painful and sad for him. But he got a lot of of extra TV time out of that. He got a lot of extra mama snuggles and some extra popsicles, too, that his brothers and sister did not get because they were not sick. Sometimes good things happen that wouldn't have happened except for the bad thing that happened. See what I mean? It doesn't mean that it was okay that he got sick. It doesn't, 
erase the bad. It just says that something good can come out of something not so good. And so a lot of times in our lives, if we look back on the hard times, we can see that God brings something good out of something hard. Another example that's maybe not such a personal example, but anyone who's watched the movie Inside Out, kids and grown-ups both, anyone who's watched the movie Inside Out knows about this. There's, throughout the whole beginning part of the movie, there's this feelings character. Her name is Joy, and her whole job is to make sure that the human she inhabits, Riley, is joyful all the time, is happy all the time. Towards the end of the movie, though, there's a turning point. Joy finds one of Riley's old memories. And this was a happy memory. This was a memory when her mom and dad were sitting on a tree limb next to her on either side of her, and they were laughing together and having a happy time, and then she hops down from the tree branch, and all of her friends are there cheering for her and supporting her, and it's a really just positive, happy, heartwarming memory. But then Joy looks back a few moments earlier in the memory and realizes that what happened right before then was that Riley had something really sad happen. She's playing hockey, her favorite sport, and she had the puck and was about to make the winning shot to win the game for her team, and she missed. And she was so sad about it. And so she was sitting alone on this tree branch just ready to cry because she felt so bad about it. And then her mom and dad came over and sat on either side of her to comfort her. And then her teammates came in to support her and lift her up and say, Riley, we still love you even though you missed the shot. It's, it's okay, we still love you. And so that joyful memory of mom and dad with her and her teammates surrounding her, that joyful memory would not have happened if it hadn't been for the sadness that Riley was feeling beforehand. It's kind of like a redemption story. So our challenge in all of this, our challenge for this week, is to grab hold of the promise of redemption. So in kid terms, what that really means is the next time something sad or scary or difficult or painful happens in your life, think to yourself, this isn't the end of the story. This isn't the end of the story. And God can recycle this moment. Because that's what redemption really is. God recycling the unpleasant moments in our lives to bring something beautiful out of them. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for recycling. Thank you. Help us remember that you are always with us, ready to recycle what doesn't work for us. Help us trust in your love, now and always. Amen. first reading this morning is from uh, Ruth 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malin and Chilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malin and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people 
and given them food. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, there will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Call me no longer Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me? And the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. So Naomi returned together with Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who came back with her from the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. This ends our reading. Our second reading picks right up where our first reading leaves off. The book of Ruth is a relatively short book, and so I've taken just snippets throughout the book to give us a a sense of the scope of the story. Now, Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a prominent rich man of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain behind someone in whose sight I may find favor. She said to her, Go, my daughter. So she went. She she came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. As it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now, here is our kinsman, Boaz, with with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. She said to her, All that you tell me, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had instructed her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk, and he was in a contented mood, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came stealthily and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and there, lying at his feet, was a woman. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your cloak over your servant, for you are next of kin. He said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. This last insistence of your loyalty, this last instance of your loyalty is better than the first. You have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not be afraid, for I will do for you all that you ask. For all the assembly of my people know that you are a worthy woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed, and he became the father of Jesse, the father of David. 
Now these are the descendants of Perez. Perez became the father of Hezron, Hezron of Ram, Ram of Aminadab, Aminadab of Nation, Nation of Salmon, Salmon of Boaz, Boaz of Obed, Obed of Jesse, and Jesse of David. This is a message of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Beloved, Ruth's story is a story of redemption, both for Ruth and Naomi. It's also a story of unshakable love, loyalty, and companionship. This is a wonderful, rich, inspiring story. It's a story of the sort of love and loyalty and companionship that are critical to the well-being of a community and were essential in bringing about God's redemption story through Ruth. And so that's why I chose Ruth's story to lift up today as part of our Women in the Bible series that we're wrapping around Mother's Day this year. The story begins with Naomi, not with Ruth. Naomi had two sons with her husband. Um, Her two sons soon married women right after Naomi's husband died. So Naomi married Elimelech. They had two sons. The two sons married other women. And then the two sons died, leaving just Naomi and her two daughters-in-law. So Naomi told her daughters-in-law to do what was best for them, which would be to return to their family of origin and to seek new husbands among their communities from which they came. One of them, Orpah, did so. And understandably so, let's be careful not to vilify Orpah for making a totally reasonable choice. Ruth, on the other hand, was a bit more stubborn. She did not return to her family of origin. She was determined to stay with Naomi. And so she returned with Naomi to Naomi's hometown. Now when they got there, it was barley harvesting time, so Ruth decided to go out and glean in the fields nearby. Um, Gleaning was a common practice in that time and in that place. What would happen is someone who was living in poverty would go during harvest season and travel along the rows of barley or whatever was being harvested behind the workers who had been hired by the field owner. So the field owner had hired workers who would go along and harvest all of the barley and and then the gleaners would come along behind them and gather up whatever was left behind. And so Ruth went to this field nearby to glean some barley so that she and Naomi could have something to eat. Well, it turned out that this field that she wound up in belonged to a a, a relative of Naomi's late husband. The relative's name was Boaz, and the relative was actually quite rich. And so Naomi and Ruth, Ruth together hatched a plan. Really, it was Naomi's idea, and Ruth executed this plan. Now, this is the part friends, where the story loses its G rating and becomes a PG-13 story. Because there are children who join us from home, I'm going to need the adults to hear between the lines to catch some of the richness of this story. So here was the plan. Naomi told Ruth to do all of this, and she did it. Ruth was to wash herself clean, to put on some nice perfume, to get all dressed up, and to go where Boaz would have been overseeing his employees in their work. She did this, and she waited in secret for Boaz to have a really good, satisfying meal and a really good, satisfying drink, or two or three after dinner. And once Boaz was feeling all warm and relaxed, he went to the threshing floor where he was working, and he laid down and he went to sleep. Ruth came to where he was while he was sleeping and uncovered his feet. In ancient Hebrew texts, feet are a euphemism. Ruth came to where he was laying and uncovered Boaz's feet, if you will. And a few hours later, Boaz woke up to see this beautiful young woman, all clean and fresh smelling and really nicely dressed up, lying right next to him and his uncovered feet. 
Boaz, who was probably still feeling the effects of his drink or two or three after dinner, took a quick minute to catch Ruth's name and then decided he ought to marry her. He ought to marry this woman. And so soon after that, he did. He married Ruth not long after that. The marriage of Ruth and Boaz brought about financial security, abundance of food, connectional community, kinship for Naomi and Ruth. This plan that Naomi devised, that Ruth implemented, brought about the redemption of two desolate women's lives. Which brings me to a really interesting point about bread. Bread. We're going to switch a little bit. See, Naomi and her late husband were initially from Bethlehem. What a lot of people don't know, or maybe you do, is that Bethlehem literally translates to mean house of bread. And so Naomi left the house of bread full with her husband and her kids and her happy life and returned empty, a widow whose children had died. But by the time her story ends in the house of Bethlehem, in the house of bread, rather, Naomi is full again. In fact, she's so full that she's able to nurse her grandchild. That's pretty magically full. She's so full that she's able to nurse her grandchild. She left the house of bread full. She found herself emptied, completely emptied returned during barley harvest season and was filled back up again. Not only this, but out of Bethlehem, the house of bread, came both the redemption for Naomi and Ruth and the redemption for all of humankind. See, out of all of the tragedy and loneliness and emptiness and grief that they had experienced came new life filled with joy and provision and connection. And out of that same redemption story of Naomi and Ruth came another more significant redemption story altogether. See, right after Boaz and Ruth got married, they had a son. His name was Obed. Obed had a son whose name was Jesse, who had a son who turned out to be the King David. The most, one of the most renowned kings of Israel. But the redemption story doesn't stop there because then David had a son who had a son who had a son and so on for 20 some odd generations. And then we read this later on in the Bible. And Jacob, one of the ancestors of David, one of the, one of the offspring of David, David is Jacob's ancestor, and Jacob begot Joseph the husband of Mary, from whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Ruth's unwavering loyalty to Naomi brought about provision and redemption from Bethlehem, the house of bread, for Ruth and for Naomi. And from Ruth's marriage to Boaz came the lineage of Jesus himself, the very bread of life. Born in Bethlehem, to bring about our redemption. Beloved, God has been working out redemption in our world since the beginning of humanity. God will continue to do so this day. And so whatever is broken in our world, in our families, in our bodies, in our spirits, all of that brokenness is subject to the redemptive power of the God who loves us all and performs great miraculous redemption stories across many hundreds of years. And so, for the provision and redemption that we find in Jesus, the bread of life, and in all of the ways that holy love is still moving mightily among us, we say, thanks be to God. Amen. Would you stand as you're able to join in singing, Sing Alleluia to the Lord.
and let us take a moment now to share our joys and concerns with one another. A few concerns that have come across my radar recently. Uh, one, of course, is continued ongoing prayers for all of those <coughs> devastated by the conflict in Ukraine. Um, another, much more personally connected to our community, uh, we've been asked to pray for a young woman named Andrea who is about to undergo a major surgery as part of treatment for cancer diagnosis that she has. And so we'll be holding Andrea in prayer that the surgery is successful and that the healing is quick and complete. I'd also ask us to pray today for um, some stuff going on in the denomination. Several weeks ago, I sent a letter out to the congregation letting you all know that on May 1st, which is today, um, a, a, a group of United Methodists would be breaking away from the United Methodist Church to start their own new denomination called the Global Methodist Church. That day is today, and so um, I'm always happy to answer questions about that. I don't want to belabor it from the pulpit, just to say uh, that we are called upon to hold all of our siblings in Christ in prayer, regardless of what is happening denominationally, as far as that goes. So let's take a few moments then to come before God in prayer. O oh God who redeems us, you are faithful always. Your word is sure, your promises are true, and your essence is love. We praise you this day, O oh God, for you alone are worthy of our praise. You alone are worthy of our hearts. We confess, O oh God, that we do not always love you with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. That we do not always love our neighbors as ourselves. That sometimes, O oh God, we struggle to love ourselves as you love us. Even so, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for we know that you have forgiven us and are forgiving us still. We give you thanks for your mercy washes over us and your grace abounds. We give you thanks for the love that we share with you and with one another. For the joy of the sunshine. For the nourishment of the rain for the people with whom we share community, and for this space in which we do so. We give you thanks especially, O oh God, for your redemptive love which never ends. And we pray that your love would surround those most in need this day. We lift up all who are ill or injured, in mind, in body, or in spirit. And we pray for your healing touch upon them. We pray for all who are grieving.
that your comfort might surround them. We pray for all who are living in fear or in violence. that you would protect them and return our world to peace. We pray for all who are living in scarcity or in poverty, that we might be bearers of bread for them. We pray for all who are imprisoned, for all who are oppressed, that all might know freedom in your name. We pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus, for whom we give thanks this day. Amen. Let us take a moment now to live out the prayer that we just prayed by giving back to God a bit of that which God has given to us.
seated. And let us join together in the great thanksgiving as we prepare our hearts for this holy feast. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to God, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, I invite you to take the bread of life broken that we might be made whole. Take and eat. And now the blood of Christ poured out that we might be filled to overflowing. Take and drink. And now, as we celebrate the joy of this wondrous feast and all that it represents, I invite us to stand as we're able to join in singing Amazing Grace.
Amen. Please be seated to receive these words of blessing and the blessing of the music to follow. I, I almost kind of have nothing to say. That was our benediction. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Thank God for the promise of redemption that God has been weaving throughout all of human history and continues to weave in our lives today. Amen.